Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well over here. I, I notice uh, I have my glasses on today, and I can only think, where are yours? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's 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 very awesome. Uh, obviously, I uh, have been talking about it in previous episodes, but uh, I went in to get LASIK surgery uh, one week ago yesterday. Um, so I've been seeing clearly the the glasses are gone. Um, so, so I'm I'm loving this. Uh, it's it's taking a little bit longer than I'd like to get to get used to the medium vision that that I need to work at my computer but I'll tell you going out for a walk in the woods it's like night and day I mean high def everything looks looks incredibly beautiful m- way more beautiful than I than I ever thought was possible when you go out on walks then do you uh not do you not wear glasses or do you wear well, did you oh did you used to wear glasses or well, what I used I used to not because that was just kind of a way for me to to give my eyes a rest and and also glasses gotcha, I I'd, yeah. I'd found as I gotten older I could never really get a good fit and as I was wearing glasses as I got older I used to take them off to uh, to work out in the gym because I could see just yeah. you know enough to to grab the weights and I used to take them off to go walking or to do body weight stuff any anything where I really didn't need them where I was more like doing doing more motor skills. I used to take my glasses off. Doing so, my eyes kind of like refocused because the way my glasses were were like a little bit crooked. Like no matter yeah. what pair I had, like for the past several years, they were always just a little bit crooked and, and pulling my eyes one way or the other. And that's that's kind of what I think um, the eye doctors say when your eyes need to get used to your glasses. It's just like you need to get used to them being just a little bit wrong because they, they can never really be perfect, right? Right. So that, right. Was, that was absolutely bugging me. I mean – that is a that's that's a very small <laughs> problem to be bugging me about. Um, there, there were other reasons why I think LASIK was a good idea for me, but uh, ultimately, you know, I'm I'm starting to get uh, all that that blurriness diminishing, and and it's actually just not, swelling yeah. on the eyes. So once once that goes down, I mean, it's it, I had 2020 as soon as the procedure was over. It took like five, maybe seven minutes. That's awesome. That's exciting stuff right there. And you you kind of explained the process earlier, but just a laser cutting your eye like yeah yeah you, 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 the, you know the, the the weirdest thing is you know smelling that burned flesh all right, all right uh, you know, it's, yeah yeah do you want to jump into news here uh sure yeah we got a couple things that have been floating around uh so the first one as we covered in a previous episode uh docker hub still is intending to uh, update their image retention policy however they have delayed it if you remember the last episode we were talking about the retention policies were due to take effect november 1st 2020 and they have pushed that back yeah it looks like what they're changing their model now based on uh consumption based subscriptions so does that mean the more polls are just going to start charging for that so they 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 still are implementing the rate limiting um what they're not doing is they are they're, they're not dropping those old images they're they're keeping those around for the time being it's still even crazy to think about, though, but it, I'm reading it right here. Anonymous free users will be limited to 100 pulls per six hours and authenticated free users, 200 pulls per six hours. 100 pulls is pretty insane in, over the yeah. course of six hours. You know, I might pull one or two images down. Granted, if you're using a whole ton of automation and you're spinning up, maybe you need 200 services. But I think that's a, a very generous limit that they have set. Yeah, and, and those are for not logged in users, I believe, too. So right. if you if you imagine if you're using a public repository of images that you are using to help auto scale whatever you have going on, then that is going to definitely come into play where you're pulling to to compensate for whatever that is. And at that point, too, it, best practice says to re-architecture it so you ha- you, so you have a local cache. Right. Right. So once again, this is simply pushing us as a community towards a better practice, uh, you know, especially when it comes to the architecture of how you're constructing your infrastructure. You know, app developers have been doing this for a while. Infrastructure guys have kind of gotten away with a bare minimum in order to, it just works, right? Now Docker Hub saying it's not good enough for you to just continue to use our service in order to make your stuff just work. Right. Now you need to step up and start architecting it intelligently. 
whether that be you know creating your own repo your own what docker registry your registry is that what it's yes. called is that what they call it or yeah like you said caching you know maybe you hold it on one box and clone the box to scale i, I don't know if that's best practice at, by any means but it's definitely an option uh the other news item here that i thought was um unfortunate uh was <laughs> next cloud letting their certificates expire <laughs> <laughs> this is weird too. I've seen a rash of this lately. It was it was maybe two months ago, I believe, that Manjaro let their certificates expire. Um, there was another big software service uh, that let theirs expire. I was actually on Matrix, and someone in the channel uh, posted this and said, "Hey, does this work for anyone else?" And then five <laughs> minutes later, they're like, "I opened a bug report for it," and sure enough. Download.nextcloud.com as well as docs.nextcloud.com were affected. So those were running with uh, invalid certificates that had expired uh, for a while. I don't know when it was fixed. Uh, it, the issue was just closed. <laughs> that's what I saw. No comments or anything. Just <laughs> And that's frustrating too. Like, you know, you, at least let me know what happened to this. Don't clo- don't assume that, you know, either I'm in the forums or, you know, I'm right. in the chat room. I, I didn't see anything in the chat room. I'm sure there's something on the forum about this. Uh, but yeah, it's it was frustrating to just see it closed, you know, without even a link to where the explanation is given. You know, there, yeah. there was... I'm, try, I'm trying to remember Some, something let their certs expire and it, and it was a big deal. I mean, it, it's absolutely a big deal when you let your certs expire, when you're, when your code hard codes, <laughs> your upstream to pull from. And those, those upstreams have their certificates expired. You're, you know, your, your clients are kind of screwed at that point. So like it, it any kind of an explanation would be, would be helpful here. Shoot. Even a thanks would be nice. I mean, yeah. Pointing it out is, the first step there, you know, identifying it, they could have let that go for a while. I'm sure if no one pointed it out, I mean, obviously people are probably looking, people are looking at it every day. So, um, it would have been noticed, but geez, I, I, that's, I think that's hilarious that that happened. Yeah. So hopefully, and, and you know, it, it, having a write up and, and like I said, I don't know if it's on the form or not, but having a write up would hopefully instill a little bit more confidence in their process going forward that yeah. they were able to remediate what happened this time, right? And, and, and I don't have that confidence right now because I, I haven't gotten anything from them. So I'll I'll see if there's any follow up to this. Um, but I I expect us to see this more and more often. What's that? I, just certificates expiring in general. Oh, okay. okay. Right. Because as as there are different policies enforced, specifically the Chrome browser, I believe right now will not trust any certificate longer than two years. That that is va- that has a, a valid date for for two years so as these companies are pushed to go towards smaller and smaller time limit cert, certs right you're not going to have these big enterprises or these big organizations five ten year certs just signed and ready to go yeah. some admins like oh yeah you know in three months that expires I, I should start renewing it now yeah and there's two different types of cert that there's one that's human verified and there's one that's automatic so the ones that we use on our instances the let's encrypt those certs are automatically verified by Let's Encrypt by the the Acme protocol, whereas there are there are, are different types of certificates that get verified by actual human beings, whether that's a phone call or an email contact or, or something along those lines before the certificates are actually issued. And it's supposed to if you if you look at your browser and see that little green lock in your URL bar and it says the actual name of the company, like you know GitHub Inc. or whatever, that will give you that that means that that is an actual human verified certificate rather than you know one that's just automatically issued yeah are those the ones i'm thinking uh is that what verisign and uh who i'm trying to think of the other big providers is that do they uh like to verisign do the uh human confirmed cuz i know they sell the certs sure so there are a couple types of cert there's extended verification certification so evssls there's organization validated certificates, OVSSLs, and then there's domain validated certificates, DVSSLs, right? So the DV is what you use if you're able to set up one of those let's encrypt. Uh, I'm going to put this one file here. You verify that I was able to put that file on the website. Therefore, I own the website yeah. and you can give me a cert for it. 
that is going to be a domain verified certificate, right? An organization validated. Well, it's basically a a surface level investigation into the entity. So uh, here I'm looking at <laughs> serverguy.com. It, this 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 <laughs> tracks with what I understand. <laughs> Um, I just don't know how reliable a source this guy is for literally anything else. Uh, but, but he says the certificate authority investigates the organization, making the application, though not very deeply. Um, they will contact the organization to make sure it's authenticated, right? Uh, whereas extended validation, um, you know, is that the CA validates the ownership, the organization information, physical location, legal existence of the company. They, they do sure. a deep dive into okay. who you actually are and make sure you are who you are. Yeah. Um, so like, like PayPal is going to have that extended validation and it's going to be marked in the browser. This is PayPal Inc., right? Um, standard validation is just going to have the HTTPS, you know, in, in, in the lock there. And that's what we use. We don't use the, uh, yeah. Ex- did we use the, uh, what don't, what'd you say? Domain, domain yes. SSL, just basically yeah, domain validation. Yep. On the site. Yep. This is actually you. Good to go. Which is perfectly sufficient for, what we're doing. Um, I, I would say we don't, we're not processing anything crazy. Uh, right now we, I, right now, I guess we'd say we don't need the deep dive into the organization to confirm. And I also know it's a boatload of money getting those. Yes. So it's a, it's a trade off, right? The reason why PayPal does it is because they're handling a lot of money on a day to day basis and they need the people that they're working with to be super confident to trust that right. they are who they are. Right. Right. Um, and, and that's going that extra mile. What's right. your risk assessment for this? Right. What, what do you actually need for this? Uh, is this something where you're going to benefit in the long term by having an extended validated cert or is this something that a, a domain validated cert is going to be just fine with? Right. Um, and, and the trade off is with that extended validated cert or the organization validated cert, those are going to take time to implement too. That's going to take right. up someone's time in order to go through that process. Time is money, as we all know. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of, a lot of money to do that on top of the money it already costs to get those special type of certifications uh, or certificates. And is the reward worth that? cost you know and, right. and and what is the risk you're taking on if you don't do that um not only the risk you take on if you don't do that but the risk you take on when you do do that because the risk as Nextcloud found out is that you forget to renew your certificates <laughs> and they expire right so so then you have you have expired certificates that take a while to renew right whereas domain validated certificates you know specifically ones that are using the acme protocol those can be renewed you know, a daily automatically right? you check yeah, daily automatically. Say. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no reason not to automate that. And it just makes it that much easier. Yeah. That'll be, it, it's funny you say that. Cause it'll be interesting to see where we go with these organization extended validation becoming a shorter and shorter life cycle. Yeah. Cause five years, you know, that's not too bad to say, all right. And it takes maybe three months to get or however long, and then they issue it and you apply it fine. That might take three months, but you know, you do that once every five years, that's no big deal. But, you know, if you're doing that once a year, once every other year, yeah, and that's a longer process, you're in, you, you're spending time and you said it money just to, just for the SSL cert. Yeah. So we'll see where next uh, takes this. Yeah. Well, we'll see what they do. So, yeah. Uh, onto some R Compose developments. And, and this episode may feel a little rushed today. It's because we are under a personal time constraint. Um, so we're just going to go through what we have, um, in, in a relatively timely manner, but I did want to touch on this. So compositional rule 2.5 was just released, uh, and, and tagged. And actually we're up a 2.5.1 because why is 0.0 never actually valid? <laughs> Should have been an, a release candidate. <laughs> so, well, yeah, dot O um, is always a release candidate, right? <laughs> dot O is always a release candidate. Yeah. <laughs> That's terrible, but yeah. Until you start running it, you know, <laughs> So, so that was just released. Uh, that includes a couple of fixes and Jack and I actually internally talked about, you know, roadmaps and, and, uh, release notes and stuff like that. We, we just, we just don't have any right now. We're, we're too small really to, to care about that. Uh, but there were a couple of major things that made it into that, uh, specifically the, uh, user admin creation and, and the initial admin creation, right? Yeah. So for, for the compositional role, at least the, 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 initial administrator creation. Uh, so it, it will create, uh, 
an admin user uh, on all the services that have user signups. Like, for instance, Shekel doesn't, so it's not going to create an admin user there. But for Camboard, for Nextcloud, it's going to go in there and automatically create an admin user with the password that's specified so that can go f- go in and, and, and make those API calls as it needs to. Um, and, and, and just kind of to set that user up in the back end. We, it's, it's very locked down right now. Like all the, uh, admin users are hard, hard coded to use the username admin, right? The, there's, it's, it's a very remedial implementation right now. But I was happy to get all the services to the point where we could automatically register this user. Like the, the Bitwarden was a pain, was a Man. pain to get going. You gotta just say that. You, yeah, you gotta just explain that one. Oh man. Okay. So, so Bitwarden has a, a web interface to it built into the service. And that web interface, in order to allow signups, uh, well, in order to process signups, literally sends a, a post, uh, with, uh, generated strings based on your username and password, right? And, and those are all generated client side and, and kept client side. So there's no actual secrets that are passed to the Bitwarden instance. That's, that's one of the brilliant parts about Bitwarden is that it really doesn't keep any of your secrets unhashed, right? So like when, when you're submitting stuff, it's actually everything is hashed and everything's hashed on the client side before it's sent over to the server. That's great and all, unless you're trying to implement a login solution where you can't have the server create that, all that for you. You have to, you have to implement your own client. Um, and, and there were two things that were very helpful in this. First of all, there was an old uh, Bitwarden API client uh, that registered uh, a, a, a new account for you. However, since that had been released and, and really last updated, Bitwarden's web API defaulted to a newer version of crypto like not a newer version but like a, a, a different hashes and and different yeah, uh, yeah ways to ways to create those the, the the old old way was still valid in that if i created the account using the the cli that in in, in python that this guy had written up um i could i could use it to log in and, and retrieve secrets and that was all fine because it had specified in the code that we were using this version of of hashes and stuff. Well, right. the, the web interface, you can't, you can't specify what version of hash you need to use, right? So when I'm, I'm writing up this custom client in order to register accounts, I want to make sure it's using the same one that the web interface is. So when we go to yeah. log in via the web interface, it actually works. Uh, so that took me like four days to, to, <laughs> to figure that out. I'm just straight up, just like after we're coming here and, and trying to figure out what Getting is the going crypto on, library what to work in the with, world uh... is going on. Oh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. So uh, doing doing a whole bunch there. Um, Firefly and Bookstack were interesting because they're both PHP. Uh, well, and Camboard, really, because uh, they're, they're, they're all PHP uh, services. And what I ended up doing is literally copying a custom PHP script over into the container and running that in order to create the user. <laughs> now, there's also a corollary in the Playbooks repository. Uh, and, and those are pretty much the same functionality, but they create uh, user admins. So, like, uh, when I create a service when I spin up a service for myself, right? I not only want to have the, the admin login with the, the random password, but I also want to be able to log in as myself uh, right after the service is created. I don't want to go and log in as an admin, create my own user, log out, and then log in as my own user for all of the service that I have right, deployed, right. right? I want to create my user with my password on all those services. Now we're, we're talking about ways to do, you know, SSO in the background, yada, yada. Not there yet. So we have to think, all right, what do we do in the meanwhile? What, well, if we yeah, can, what's the first we, step to getting there? I think yeah, if the we question. can, if we can set all the passwords initially, then that's, that's perfect. Right. And that's, that's exactly what we're, we're doing here. So we're setting the passwords. And then once those passwords are set across all of the services, uh, then you can log into them using that username and, and password. Sometimes they're emails, sometimes they're usernames, and it's just uh, idiosyncratic to the service itself. Right. You know, this is a much better step than emailing passwords out once they're created. Right, right. That's right. just insecure. Like, I'm sorry. That, well, like, that, that also defaults to uh, making sure the user changes all their passwords. Yes, and which doesn't always happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm lazy. 
I don't <laughs> always change my passwords right off the rip. It's just easier to take a screenshot of the uh, email and hold on to it and say, oh, well, these are the passwords. They look secure enough right now. You know, it doesn't it doesn't take long, though, before someone finds that email. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so, so I'm, I'm very happy with this implementation where we have uh, random passwords being generated for back end yeah, admin users. Huge kudos. Huge kudos to you on that. I'm really excited about this. It's the first it's like you said, it's the first step towards SSO is making sure we yep. can create users on the uh, services. So that was really fun. Uh, we've also done updates to all the services. Uh, we, we bumped up Camboard to the latest version. We've got uh, version bumps for, for a couple other services. Uh, that'll be in the report released as well. I'll, I'll actually probably put that into the show notes um, because that is a, a new role bump, so that would be new default services. And we also have our alpha enrollment for the R Compose uh, program. So, Jack, do you want to talk about what we're what we're doing with that? Oh, okay, yeah. So right now we're offering single instances, which is super exciting. So right now you can deploy an instance for um, R Compose. So what's really exciting is that you're able to log log into our service, log into R Compose, log into Command Center. And then deploy your own set of services. We will not send you an email of all your passwords. It, the big news is we're up and running. <laughs> Everything's talking and we're up and running. Just kind of jumping in. So this is all command center stuff. Uh, our command center application deals with all the billing. Um, it doesn't, it, it sent us an email for support, but it manages, command center manages billing instances and support. Uh, obviously we have the contact form on command center. So with command center, we provide the ability to sign up for instances, you're able to choose the services you want to deploy, and then you're able to deploy those instances for either yourself or your organization. It does everything behind the scenes. So you don't have to play system administrator and navigate all the services or, you know, hop into a command line or do anything, anything on the server. Andrew has done all of that for you, basically. <laughs> all you have to do is sign up. So we, we currently offer three tiers. Uh, we offer a minimal personal and personal plus. Right now, our minimal is still being developed. So we have personal and personal plus out there. The personal plan, we offer up to four services for your instance. I'd say it makes it a great jumping off point for anyone who wants to start to manage everything digitally. For the personal plus, we offer unlimited services. It's got more juice is what I'd say. You're less resource constrained if you're deploying the personal plus. I'd call NextCloud kind of a, a bigger application. Bookstack, I might even call a bigger application. It's a beefy boy. <laughs> Signing up is not too difficult. The one thing I'd absolutely note in Command Center is that you have to verify your email after you sign up. Uh, it was kind of a design decision. We want to make sure your email is verified just to make sure we have a good contact for you. So signing up, we have a sign up page. Uh, it's, I already said it, but it's important to note, you will not be able to sign in until your email is confirmed. So we send you an email. You have to click the link to say, yep, this is me. And then after that, you're off. Deploying an instance right now, it's very easy is what I would say. There are a couple pieces of information we need to deploy, and then you're off and running your instances up. Uh, I have documentation I'll link in the show notes here, but we need a domain for you. We need a payment plan. We need the plan you want, and we need the services. So there's four four things. It's, it's pretty basic to walk through. I'd say I made it very easy, pretty dumbed down. Uh, like I said before, though, we're only offering one instance. So it, it's one email per instance. Uh, you are allowed to sign up with a different email and deploy an instance uh, and use the same credit card. Uh, it shouldn't, there's no problem for that. But y you know, you're going to have to use a different domain. Uh, domains are unique. But after you, so you fill out all this information, you click deploy, and it's taken care of. We will send you an email. We start your instance build and getting all the services ready. And then once it completes, uh, it should be, it takes 15 minutes and you're off. So 15 minutes, we send you an email saying, hey, your services are up at example.rcompose.com and you're off. When your instance is deployed, it's not at the rcompose root. It is at uh, the subdomain that you choose. So we have plans in the future for supporting your own custom domain, you know, bring your own domain and deploy the instance to that domain. That's something we're working on. But right now we're deploying them to uh, subdomains at subdomain.rcompose.com. Now, if anyone feels the need 
to run on a custom domain. That's something we can absolutely accommodate and, uh, you know, for, for, for sure. whatever additional fee you may be willing to throw our way and we can, <laughs> we can negotiate that. Uh, but, but it's, it's definitely something we plan on having by default available in the future. Right. Right. That in multiple instances are what we're working towards. So I think it's going to be a huge step getting towards multiple instances. That means you can, you know, maybe you're out there and you, you're running a, a mid-sized organization and you need, you know, developers to have their own set of services or operations team to run off their own. You can manage it all for them within one login, essentially, rather than having for you know two or three logins that you have to manage yeah and i can i can talk about my you know my my setup as well so like you and i share an instance for the company and and what we're doing right. here um i also have my personal instance which has a couple different services and and uh, i keep different things on those instances there uh, and then i also have one that i maintain for my family right so so we we are using that as well so there's absolutely a reason to have multiple instances under one one umbrella, right? Uh, and and we're working towards that. But I I'm just very very happy to see us get to this 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 point yeah. where we're we're just so click and go. I mean, we Jack has Jack has just made it so easy, you know, integrating with with what I've done, you know, and 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 kind of bringing us together here. It's it's really easy to spin up a service. I'm really happy to see this all come together, and and I just think it's it's the smoothest experience. You could not get a smoother experience. I'd agree. Yeah. The one thing I'd note, yeah, is it the, the when you create your instance and set your password on command center, that's the password that's actually propagated out to all the instances. So you don't have to go, oh, what's my pat? I, I signed up for our compose. What's my pat? They sent me my domain. What's my password? <laughs> Personally, and it's it's funny, you know, you're going to have different preferences too. So for right now, and, and this is something, a paradigm I think I want to keep um, in, in, in thinking about implementing SSO and what we would do going forward with that. But I like the ability to set different passwords on all my services. Absolutely. You know, because I have Bitwarden, I'm able to do that. I'm able to keep that, you know, in my head, keep that master password in my head without having to remember any of my other passwords. I can now go, once I have that initial log, I can go and change my password on each of those services to be something different, right? If that is a threat model that I want to counteract, I can absolutely do that. Right. Especially if you lose that password, if you lose that password, you end up getting hacked somehow, who knows? I think it's the first step I would take, at least when I deploy an instance, is taking that password, you know, changing my Bitwarden password to a, a password I can remember, and then updating every other service within Bitwarden. So I don't have to remember those. I can just auto log in with a Bitwarden password you know, a vaulted password that's already there. That's somewhat managed. Yeah. I, I, I know you said this in the Bitwarden talk, but I mean, I mean, as much as I log into Nextcloud and Canboard every day to do my day-to-day stuff, I use Bitwarden everywhere. The average user has, the average person has 273 passwords, I think is what I said on the Bitwarden talk. Mm. So if you're looking at it, if you're looking at services to pick out, in command center, uh, the first one at the top of the list. I is mean, Bitwarden. not because it's alphabetical or anything, but still, <laughs> I would highly recommend it. <laughs> I'd say we're constantly updating the site, making it better, working on it. Um, we have contact page if you need to reach out to us. Uh, we do get alerted. Yeah, if, that. if you do need to get in contact with us, uh, obviously, if you're on the R Compose Cast site because you're listening to this podcast, uh, we have a contact page there that'll get to us. Uh, you can contact us through rcompose.com or you can even go on to rcompose.locals.com and contact us through yeah. there as well. Yep. The use cases page, we have a couple examples of, you know, who would use this product and why. And then we also have in it a link to our integrations and our runners. So would highly recommend checking those out. Again, those are going to be a contact to us right now until we start to get a, a more of a baseline for our runners packages and integrations. Yeah, Jack, we, we sort of, I mean, I, I guess we're talking about it in the integration discussion, but you did just update a lot of pages on here. You made them very pretty, added footers and stuff like that. So <laughs> not you know. a CSS guy. So <laughs> as much as you say that, as much as you say that, you do, no, you do the no, heavy no, lifting. No. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you do pretty well too. Yeah. You know, I think that's important. 
when you sign up for a service, uh, you have to know that if it was just HTML, I'd be kind of wondering if they can't make the page look pretty, what, you know, what's going on in the back end on this. So it, it, it looks are important no matter what, no matter what people say, <laughs> yep. it has to look pretty. Yep. So it does look good. Um, obviously it, the whole, everything's open source. So if you, if you look at it and you say, I, I don't trust these guys or whatever, whatever kind of reason, if you just want to dive into the source code, command center is out there and it's available. Now, right now we don't offer it as a service to deploy just because it's specific to us, but it is out there. If you want to go check it out and run it and I guess compete against us. <laughs> well, and, and here's the thing too, right? If, if you're, if you're that technically inclined, right? If, if you honestly do feel like you're better off running this yourself, all of this is open source. Right. Yeah. Command center is probably not going to benefit you that much because right. it's, it's kind of custom tailored to what we're doing. Uh, right. But portal is unique to an instance. Right. And, and if you did really want to spin up an instance of command center to use it for something else, right. As a basis for something else, the, the compositional role actually provides the ability to deploy command center with default keys and everything you need to get right. started. It, you know, for, for development purposes, it can be ready straight away. So if if you're looking, if you've got the technical know-how in order to deploy this yourself, I mean, th there's a reason why we open source this. It's, it's because we believe in the ability to do that. We believe that that's going to make us better. It's uh, Ruby on Rails and React. And I use, I think, Bootstrap 4. Cool. Well, uh, Jack, what what else do you want to touch on on Command Center? I know we've gone through kind of the, the process, the, the rationale behind our compose and we've gone over some of the front end changes that you've made. Yeah. I think the one note, uh, I, I think I already touched. I, I don't think I have anything more to add really, honestly. Uh, I, I kind of talked about the roadmap and some of the features we want to include, uh, which were multiple instances, you know, obviously bumping up some technical things, you know, and cleaning up a lot of what's, what's in there right now. But I don't have anything else to add right now. Okay. Well, I would just go ahead and, and plug our book stack documentation. I'll make sure to link that into the show notes. Yeah. Uh, I noticed I forgot to add that. Yep. That's, that's fine. I'll actually probably put a link directly to how to deploy an instance because I, I okay. think it is a very good overview. Um, it has lots of screenshots and clarification uh, on any questions that you might have. So with that, uh, should we move straight into our grab bag? I think so. Yeah, I'm excited for this grab bag. Okay. This grab bag episode may seem a little off the cuff, uh, and that's because we've been doing a lot of things. Me personally, I've been prepping for Linux Fest. Uh, I did give the talk uh, that I had given last episode on Ansible, so I was I was happy to do that again. And I think the back and forth uh, between Jack and I really helped out on that. Uh, and and then yeah. uh, between Jack and I, we have also been kind of scrambling to to get to that 2.5 release. Yeah, uh, so totally. so we, we were we were really happy to do that. So I wanted to put together something really easy this week. Uh, I was inspired by one of my favorite podcasters, uh, Chris Curran, uh, has a podcast engineering school uh, show that he produces. Uh, yep. He is a former audio engineer. Yep. Um, you know, big, big in the, the, the music industry and has, has been around, right? Has built, really been around and, and his pitch is that, you know, he, he's seen uh, the rise of podcasts, you know, and the popularity and, and just the mass explosion that, that happened. And he noticed that a lot of people weren't getting good audio, uh, you know, and him as an audio engineer was perfectly poised uh, to be able to jump into that space and give, uh, give help. He does, uh, help produce podcast so he will actually produce a podcast for you if that's something that you don't feel that you're technically capable of doing but he also does you know in in the spirit of podcasting he kind of gives out his knowledge right in in order to build his credibility so he's he's doing that and, and giving tips and tricks you know reading that from his blog or interviewing people as to how they are doing their podcasts one of the things that Chris does whenever he has a guest on is to to walk them through a five minute uh, lead off segment of you know give me well I think it's thirty seconds actually pitch of what is your entire production stack go 
it, it's great the responses because sometimes they'll focus on the hardware, sometimes they'll zero in on the software, and it's it's really up to what is important to you in those thirty seconds, and then that yeah, really yeah. sets a tone for the rest of the conversation. And, and I, I think it is just a really brilliantly done podcast. It's it's not simply you know a a, a good podcast is also a good sounding podcast. So if you had 30 seconds right now, what would you say our stack would be? Real quick, just off the cuff, what would you say? Would you go hardware or would you go software? I know where I would go with it. All right, uh, 9, 30. Okay, so if I had 30 seconds, what I would say is uh, I think my biggest thing right now is my MXL 990 that I yeah. record into my microphone. I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, it just was such a boost in sound quality in order to get that. Um, and then that's into my audio interface, into my computer. Um, there's also a fan back here that makes a lot of noise. So I actually have to deal with that in post. Yeah, so, yeah. so I go back afterwards and uh, we're recording everything through OBS so that we get the video as well so that we can do the little promo segments and stuff. Uh, and then I go into software and I, in Audacity, clean up the audio. Um, yeah. I, I take out the, uh, I, I put the no- noise gate on it. Wow, I'm so over 30 seconds. It's not even <laughs> funny. That's like 45 right there. Um, I put the, uh, not the noise gate, um, uh, the noise reduction on it. Uh, I, I normalize the volume. I do my cuts uh, and then I uh, add compression and... Uh, then I, I publish a podcast and I'm also using Shotcut to create the videos that actually go up on YouTube with the audio visualizer, uh, as well as the promos that we cut together. Okay, so that was that was about a minute <laughs> 15. That was a minute 15 right there just to describe all that. Wow. Wow. Jack, anything to add add there before we, we dive in? Or uh, No, I'd say the two big things are OBS and Audacity. Yeah. So I want to go through the the gear that we have um, and and take a look into to what's going on there. So so I did I did start off mentioning my MXL 990, uh, and that was that's probably been my favorite purchase this year. Well, besides the eyeballs, uh, but the 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 this this microphone has really been a, a game changer, right? First of all, it you know it's it's bumping up from me using my webcam, right, or or my headphone microphone into something that's actually meant for audio production. Uh, and and that quality really does shine through. I remember I was asking one of my uh, colleagues at my day job who actually graduated with an audio engineering degree and he he mentioned this microphone. I mean right off the top of my head because I was yeah. asking him, you know, what's if you had to, you know, anything, go. And he's like, MXL 990, just just go for it. So, Off the top so, of the yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and it was a reasonable price, so I, I picked it up, and, and I've been happy with it ever since. Um, it's, it's just a really great microphone. I'm feeding that into my audio interface. And, Jack, I'd be interested with, with, with what your setup is there for microphones. I got a Shure SMB7. I'll tell you how I got this thing. I asked for it for Christmas one year because I was going to do the uh, crazy thing of – recording my voice to do one of those like train train uh, a machine learning model to learn my voice so i could do a text to speech yeah. with my voice unfortunately that i didn't sit down and you know y- you have to map all the words you're saying to how it's coming out and kind of map everything i i didn't get that project off the ground i kind of ran i i got busy is what i'd say <laughs> We've been doing our compose stuff. I, I just haven't had the time. Haven't haven't sat down and recorded anything. But you know, I had it, and I was like, "Oh!" And you said, Let, "Let's do a podcast." I'm like, "I'm thinking that's that sounds great. That's perfect." Like, <laughs> so it just kind of picked up, right? I, I don't know what I call maybe a blessing in disguise. <laughs> had the microphone, ended up. I was I, I had the stuff I was working on, and then just ended up. We started end up recording the podcast. Now, uh, now you didn't have a mic stand when we started. Yeah, I forget what I was using at that point. I think it was just like was something on the the front of the table or something. Oh yeah, I had a uh, so I had, which was fine. It worked. I had a uh, a mic for like a live show, like just a pole. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. I just had the pole. Yeah, yeah. Just a straight up pole, like just like a stand up, yeah, yeah, stand up yeah. comedy kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what but... about that airplane food, everybody? <laughs> But yeah, picked up a mic stand. I honestly, Amazon couldn't tell you what it is. It's like ten uh, bucks. Yeah, I got a 
Focusrite audio interface. I don't know. It's got one input for a microphone and one for a guitar. Do you use your, your what is that, a quarter inch jack there? Yeah, yes. Do you, do you use that to record anything or have you? I or? was for a little bit. Yeah, I got I got lucky. I actually had my audio interface before I got the mic. And the reason so I had did, that is because... I was going to say, how did that end up happening? So so, so similar to you, I also had a, a Christmas wish list <laughs> that got fulfilled. Um, I got a pair of uh, JBL studio monitors, um, which awesome. I absolutely adore. I mean... So, so I, you know, I, I unwrap these things uh, up, up in Cleveland. You know, I'm, I'm stoked. I bring them down here. I go to plug everything in, and I'm like, um, I don't have quarter inch jacks on my computer to plug these into. So I'm, I'm sitting here like, you know, what do I do? And I, I had my, old, my dad's old set top player deck. Right? They, it was yeah. A, it was an old thing. It had, you know, active speakers that it, that it powered. Um, and I was thinking I could just use that well no because that didn't have the the right inputs and stuff and then you know it, this 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 was a whole different kind of speaker studio monitors are completely different oh yeah so so what i had to do is i was like oh okay so how do i get this interface with my computer i ended yeah. up having to get a a audio interface in order to connect these these two speakers via quarter inch cables to to my computer and that just showed up as another uh, input and output device so when i got the microphone all i had to do was plug in the xlr to the xlr jack on front of that crank up the gain and yeah perfect you're there yeah yeah it was a it was the same input device so i was i was very happy that that was already there having already gone through that pain um but but the other thing is so like for those jbls yeah, uh, I, I don't use those when I'm recording a podcast. I use them when I'm mixing, but not when I'm recording the podcast. And the reason for that is that because there is a, you know, my my microphone will pick that up if, if Jack's talking and then I have to silence that whole thing. And it's just never fun in order to get that. You you hear like a delay there. And I think you pro- you can probably hear that in our first episode or two. Yeah. Uh, so, so I wanted to make sure to not do that. So I actually have it running through these uh, aftershock uh, headphones, and yeah, these are yeah. just my favorite purchase. These are these. Well, okay, I like the I like the microphone, but I use these all day. Like all, I use these to work out. I use these to mow lawn. I use these all day. These are these For are excellent. Yeah, yeah. And my favorite thing is, you know, when I'm running, my ears are open, so I can hear, you know, people yeah. coming up behind me or or whatnot. So. I just think these these are my my absolute favorite uh, things that that I've I've gotten this year hardware wise. That's awesome. Yeah, I still have my uh, make. I don't even mixing headphones. I guess if you want to call them that, they're yeah. the uh, Audio Technica. They they work. I have I have these here, and and this is this is uh, these these other ones. These you know we both have an ATH brand, which I'm thinking is code for like low quality. Probably. I don't know. I'll tell it's you like what the Epiphone. Audio Technica puts out good stuff. I'll tell you what, man. I bought these. I uh, I had my car in the shop. I think it was for tires. When I was back up in Cleveland, like when I was eighteen, I you know they told me it was going to take a while because they had to like straighten something out or something. It was that car gave me so many issues. Anyways, I ended up popping into the the Walmart that was in the same shopping center, and I was just like. I would love a pair of headphones right now, right? So, so I go and and buy these, and these have served me for you know going on ten years now, right? These these are just brilliant That's for crazy. for no good reason that at all. Crazy. These are just like a great <laughs> great pair of headphones. Oh my gosh! I, yeah, I was gonna say I think I've had these four or five years now, and they just last. Yeah. Yep. I mean, there's I I, I don't take them out though. I, there's no real wear and tear. They sit on my desk, and I put them on when i'm at work or you know just at just at home yeah but and they do a pretty good job of blocking out noise i mean they're not noise canceling or anything they're literally the the base model like <laughs> yeah but I, I i have never sat down and said well i need a good pair of headphones because these do the trick yeah yeah hey, i don't know how you are. i blow through headphones do you want to jump into software yeah what are you thinking yeah so i don't know i thought you were going to cover the uh so we do use OBS to record, and then we use Audacity. And I was thinking real quick, do you want to dive into kind of how we post 
Yeah, so Audacity, I'm just going to do this off the top of my head because, Jack, I know you need to get out of here soon. But yeah, uh, so uh, Audacity, there's a, there's a couple things I run through. Obviously, we're importing the files uh, from the MKV that OBS exports. So I import those. And the very next thing I do is to go in and do noise reduction. And what yeah. that entails is for me to grab a section of my audio uh, to, to, to highlight it and select it and, and get Audacity to sample that. And then I apply it to the entirety of my audio. And, and the, the audio that I sample is something that is only room noise. So it's a, it's, it's a point where I'm not talking. There's no reverberations in the room. It's just grabbing like the sound of my fans or, or the sound of whatever, whatever may be ambient in the room. And then I can cancel that out through the entire audio. Which is awesome, yeah. Uh, the interesting thing is when you actually sample it, you can even hear a little bit of my undertones in it. So it'll cancel those out as well. So my voice won't end up sounding as bassy. Uh, but compression will actually compensate for that on the back end. So, so after I do that noise reduction, then I will do a... I'll actually put it through compression just because at that point it'll normalize the levels out to a point where I actually hear it uh, to, to some significant loudness. Um, because otherwise the actual, for some reason, OBS records this really quietly and I, I need to bump it up in post um, in order to get it to the negative 20 luffs that, you know, iTunes and other podcasts would expect it to be at, you know, the, the kind of sound level there. So once I, once I hit that compression, then I'll go and cut the audio. So I'll cut out, you know, any, any kind of pauses like that one or any kind of, uh, <laughs> any kind of, uh, misspeaks or, or if we need to, to, to walk something back, right? We'll, we'll go ahead and cut that out. Uh, and then once we have the, the cut version, we'll go ahead and uh, export that a couple different ways. So the first way we export it is as a combined MP3, uh, which is what actually gets produced and put up on the website. Uh, then we also export it as two OGG files, uh, one per each track, and we store those. Uh, similarly to the video, we'll export the video as uh, to one WebM file and export yeah. that up into next slide, which is where we're storing all this. Uh, and then we'll export the raw audio as well. And I think, uh, we've, we've kind of agreed on, you know, going through that. That's what we really need in order. If we need to walk anything back or recut something or remaster something, right? We're going to have the raw audio. We're going to have the cut audio. If we need to make a really quick tweak or, or cut something out that we really shouldn't have said or, or we're wrong on. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll cut that out and, and republish it and, and, and get it back up there. Yeah. I, I was going to say the the cutting process isn't too bad, but I'll tell you what, adding when you had the, uh, sound normalization and everything, it, it just sounds so much better than the raw. Oh yeah. Now we haven't gotten into like EQing it or anything. I mean, the, the, the Not yet, audio right. quality that's coming out of our mics is, is fairly sufficient. I mean, it's, it's clear right. enough. It's, it's balanced enough that we don't feel like we need to necessarily, like, it's not going to make the return on investment for doing that is not going to be even near close enough that to, to what we need it to be, right? Cutting it and, and making sure it's loud enough is going to be the biggest impact that we can make. Um, and I would say actually, Jack and, and, you know, Fact check me here, but I, I'd say it takes probably about twice as long as the actual raw recording in order to to cut it. Yeah, it's about I, I'd say one and a half or two, and that's after listening to it once. Yeah, so I I always listen to the raw once, and then just yep. the next time cut cut through. So yeah, usually I go either on a walk or I'll be cutting the grass or. Uh, what have you, and and I'll give it a listen. Um, probably what I'm going to be doing this afternoon since we've got to rush it a little bit, but yeah, doing that, and then we can we can get to actually the the cutting process, which yeah, I'd say probably from from one and a half to to twice as long as the actual recording is. Anything? Any closing remarks? Any remarks? Anything you want to add? Two two things here. I mean, I know we talked about it. We record with Jitsi. Um, so, so just, just to plug to Jitsi, and it was actually funny yeah. in, in the Linux Fest comment section, we were talking about remote ways to do, uh, web, web conferencing, right? And, and Jitsi came up. And I, you know, just, just to give it another, yet another plug, you know, it's a great open source alternative to Zoom or any of the other big names that are out there today. 
Um, so, so love to see, and it is able to be self-hosted. So, so heads up, you know, if you're looking to do something like this in the future, we may be able to help you as well. And, you know, as, as we move away from our internal background infrastructure into onboarding more services, this is definitely going to be one we'll be looking at real soon. Absolutely. Um, and then, and then shortcut, man, I only got one trick for shortcut. And, and this is what I used to, to cut the videos together. Um, if you're using a large file, right, with audio, disable creating the waveforms because every time you make a cut, it repopulates the entire waveform of all the audio in the in 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 the editing you're doing. So until like we we cut it down to about a minute, and then I turn on the waveforms to get the precise cuts uh, in order to cut it exactly where I want the the, the fade in and fade out to be and stuff like yeah. that. But if I try to have waveforms on a, on a two hour long episode, it takes about 45 seconds to a minute and a half to regenerate those waveforms. And it is, it is nigh unworkable. Um, it's just, it's just very frustrating. Um, one of the other things I ran into is, uh, running out in space in my VAR partition. When Audacity saves these cuts and when Shotcut saves these cuts, they save them in VAR temp. And that's obviously to survive a reboot. It's more like a crash recovery system, but it can take like 10 gigs of space, 12 gigs of space just to save whatever working projects that you're on. Um, so make sure you got plenty of disk space, not only to store recordings, but to actually work on them as well. Right. Yeah. And, and that was just something that took me by surprise. I, I didn't even think about that before. Well, and that's all the gripes I wanted to complain about today, Jack. <laughs> I mean, did you have anything else or? I don't have anything else. All right. And, and, you know, like I said, I mean, this is, this episode is, is a kind of a product of me going out into the community. And you know, I, I, I found this because we had, uh, one of the, the, the Jupiter Broadcasting, uh, audio engineer go on the podcast engineering school and, you know, they were able to, to promote it on, on their episode. And that's the only reason I found out about this podcast, right? And, you know, usually when I go out for looking for new content, I, I, I search around a bit, right? And, and, you know, being able to, to find it when, and, and just look it up, right, is, is hard enough, you know, getting, getting this show on all the platforms on, you know, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher on, on everywhere, right? Yeah. It was a, it was a chore and a half, right? But we need a little bit more too. So for the sake of everyone who needs to hear this message, please make sure to rate and review our Compose Cast on whatever platform you're using uh, to ensure that we get found in those searches for other people who are looking for this type of content. That's all we had for today. We hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.